Uh, for now, next, I would like to introduce an amazing researcher, Sarah, Sasha Lucioni, who is working on climate change related initiatives at Mila, uh, including projects that aim to estimate the environmental impact on machine learning and to analyze financial disclosures from a climate standpoint. Sasha's work has been featured in very news and media outlets, such as MIT Technology Review, Wired, and the Wall Street Journal, among others. Both of her projects on the environmental impact on AI and those on how to reduce it. She is also a 2020 National Geographic Explorer and holds an IVADO postdoctoral scholarship. Um, I will introduce her now. Hi everyone, my name is Sasha Lucioni and today I will present to you how we can use AI to tackle climate change. Now to start and to pique your curiosity a little bit, what does this look like to you? Does it look like some alien uh, hand? Does it look like uh, a bunch of solar panels taped to a tree? Uh, what do you think this does? Like, what does this make you think of? Well, actually, this is um, an AI infused application to track deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. And so how this works is that uh, this is actually made out of an old cell phone uh, connected to a bunch of solar panels that, and it, they're taped to trees um, in different parts of the Amazon. And they actually uh, listen to the rainforest and detect um, deforestation uh, from an acoustic signal, from a sound point of view. And now, how do you think this is done? Do you think that there's a bunch of people listening to these sounds in real time and flagging uh, deforestation? Well, actually, no, this is done using artificial intelligence or AI. And how does AI listen to sounds? So actually, this is a method called unsupervised learning and actually anomaly detection because um, the AI is trained. It's given a lot of um, um, sound recordings of what the jungle normally sounds like, of birds, of rain, of monkeys, and what have you. And it builds a mental model of what the jungle sounds like on a normal day. And so compared to this mental model, if there's a, a new sound like a truck or a chainsaw, it can say, no, this sound is not like other sounds I've heard. This is an anomaly. This is not what the rainforest should sound like. And then it can flag this anomaly. And then human rangers can come in and check. Of course, um, you also need uh, the uh, implication of humans so that they actually go and, and check what's going on. But essentially, the AI is doing most of the work. And you can have like thousands of these sensors all over the Amazon. And then they they can have, it's like a, a big network of protection against deforestation. And actually, there's a company called Rainforest, Rainforest Connection that does exactly this using AI. And so for me, this is a great example of the positive potential of AI uh, in, in terms of environmental protection, because it's very concrete, it's uh, human in the loop, and it uses really cool AI technologies. And so I'll tell you more uh, about how AI can be used to tackle the climate crisis in my presentation. Now, a few years ago, um, I had a bit of a, bit of a revelation. Um, I felt so overwhelmed about uh, climate change and the climate crisis, and I felt like I should be doing something. And so I quit my job. Uh, I used to work for uh, a financial company. I quit my job and I said, I'm going to dedicate all of my resources, all of my AI training, all of my machine learning expertise to fighting the climate crisis. And actually, it was a really great uh, um, time, I guess. It was really great timing on my part because um, so I quit my job. I came to Mila, which is an AI institute in Montreal. And I met a, a bunch of people who thought kind of like me, who also had this um, desire to put their AI skills to good use. And so uh, about two years ago now, we wrote this paper called Tackling Climate Change with Machine Learning. And we were almost 20 authors, some PhD students, some professors, um, some very uh, big names in machine learning and AI. Demis Hassabis is the, is the founder of DeepMind. Joshua Bengio is one of the uh, Turing Award winners for, um, invent, or I mean, for, for pioneering machine learning. Um, Andrew Eng is, uh, uh, is, a, is a very um, successful uh, entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley. So we had these like heavy hitters behind us. And what we did is we wrote an almost 100 page paper about all the different ways in which machine learning can be used to tackle climate change. And so the way we structured this paper, uh, in case you want to 
read it is uh, we uh, identified topics, specific topics that um, we think are very crucial to, in the fight against climate change. So we identified some opportunities as high leverage, as high impact, long term, uh, short term, etc., to help people get a grasp of, you know, the timeline and the scope of different uh, climate change application um, methods. And so um, we wrote we wrote a paper. We made a website actually, climatechange.ai. Uh, you can go explore the paper and figure out, um, you know, all the different ways. Like it's kind of like this bite-sized uh, presentation of different ways in which AI can be used to tackle climate change. What we tried to do as well is to give people, to give AI practitioners, uh, a menu for action. So say um, I have a background in time series modeling, and I'm really interested in um, farms and forests you can go really in the chapter in the paper and it'll tell you what's already being done and what can be done. What are some potential uh, super, uh, poten super impactful topics that you can work on? And eventually you can look at the people who are working on it and get in touch with them and kind of get involved in their projects. So our idea was really to catalyze action, to help people get involved. And um, so we created uh, an initiative around this. Now we you know, we have a, a forum, we have a website. So we're really trying to get um, people moving to get the machine learning community moving the needle with regards to climate change. Now for some examples. Um, so I mentioned farmed and farms and forests and actually AI can be used for agriculture um, in some pretty stunning ways. So I, for example, you can have autonomous drones that can plant seeds um, that can also, for example, um, use radar, uh, use um, infrared sensors to figure out the humidity of, um, of soil, uh, the, the weather conditions, things like that. And so, for example, um, when you do have cases of deforestation, like what happened in Australia and California and Siberia, you can send out these drones packed full of seeds and they'll plant the seeds and they'll plant them in um, places where they're most likely to thrive. And so, for example, um, you can also use this in, in normal farming in, in standard agriculture to fly over your fields and create maps of where you know uh, water can um, can create stagnation, where there's dryness, et cetera, et cetera. So it can really give you a grasp of how to improve um, both agriculture and afforestation methodology when you need. And there's lots of methods. There's kind of the same things as um, for autonomous vehicles, you can use them for drones. They do uh, like uh, real-time reconnaissance and then they, they drop seeds uh, at the best moment possible. So for, for example, uh, agriculture is actually one of the big um, challenges for, for humanity to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. So in this case, AI can help. AI can also help transportation. So um, actually the global supply chain is very, very inefficient. It's very, um, it's very slow in places. There's a lot of redundancy. And so there are methodologies like operational research that can be used, for example, to improve supply chain, to uh, reduce waiting times for trucks, to make sure we're not sending things uh, all across the world to be processed and, and to make more local supply chains that are more optimized. You can also, uh, for example, in cases uh, where um, you want to figure out how much traffic there is or which roads are blocked, you can also uh, do satellite imagery to detect, uh, for example, road blockages or, or trucks. You can count the number of trucks to figure out you know, how much freight there's going on. So there's all these methods using different kinds of approaches. Uh, OR is one of them, operational research is one of them, but also satellite imagery and remote sensing is, is a really big part of, of the transportation uh, industry. It actually. Um, the issue with transportation is that there's so many moving pieces and, and that you would need to, for example, decarbonize if you wanted to reduce the greenhouse gases of that industry. So there's a lot of information that can be gathered and a lot of kind of smaller scale approaches that can be used in order to decarbonize the global transportation industry. Now, from an electricity perspective, electricity is about a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. It's, it's a, a huge thing. And if we could decarbonize grids um, scalably across the world, that would be really, really great, right? But the problem with renewable energy, why it's not so easy to just you know, switch to solar or switch to wind is that it's actually variable, right? For a coal, or, a coal, coal set, uh, plant, you can just put in coal, burn it. I mean, obviously emit a lot of greenhouse gases, but you know exactly putting in one ton of coal will give you this much energy and you can flip the switch. You can flip the switch on, for example, a diesel generator, and you know exactly how long it's going to function. But the thing, the thing is with renewables that they that they uh, fluctuate depending on weather conditions, depending on time of day, depending on season. 
And so these are all things that are kind of an impediment because you want to be able to flip the switch and make energy. So what happens when it's night? What happens if there's no wind, right? And so AI can be used to do what's called now casting, which is essentially predicting um, the production of energy in almost real time, like right now or in a couple of seconds or in a couple of minutes to figure out, for example, if there's a cloud coming. So you have like a satellite imagery of uh, the region where your solar panels are, for example, and you see a cloud coming. So you, you know that in 20 minutes, you're going to have a cloud or even in 10. And so, for example, you turn on your batteries, you store energy while you still have sun. And when the cloud passes in a couple of minutes, you don't have to uh, have a, a drop in production. So there's lots of things like that that can be done. You can also detect, uh, for example, uh, energy leaks uh, in, in, in pipes and things like that. You can, you can use infrared energy imagery to figure out heat maps and figure out where energy is being lost. So there's a lot to be done with machine learning and the energy sector. You can do predict predictive maintenance to figure out when you need to um, fix, for example, a wind turbine based on small patterns without it having to break down. You can already detect when it will need maintenance in the future. So there's really a lot of things that can be done and energy is one of like really the high impact sectors um, out there. Now I mentioned um, plotting roads. Well, actually um, this is really important uh, when there's natural disasters. So for example, if a hurricane hits and you know that there's a region that was impacted, but you don't, don't know to what extent and you want to deliver aid as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, and obviously with some monetary constraints, right? And so you want to figure out uh, quite quickly uh, whether the roads are, um, are still intact, whether the bridges are still intact, how you can get from, for example, a big city to where, you, where the hurricane hits. So this is really important to be doing this as fast as possible to do humanitarian response as efficiently as possible. So to only deploy you know, helicopters if you really need them, otherwise to use trucks and to make sure it really flows seamlessly. And so machine learning can actually do this because for example, what you can do is you can compare a satellite imagery before and maps before, and you can, you can map the maps to the satellite imagery. So you can actually see you know, a road on a map where it is on, on the satellite image. And then if you have the after image uh, quite uh, quickly, you can do the reverse. You can say, okay, well, this this is a new satellite imagery. This is how it changed. And so we can infer back to the maps and say, this road is not there anymore. Uh, this bridge is broken, et cetera, et cetera. Like this part of the village is eroded. So you can do this kind of real-time mapping very quickly based on kind of paired uh, images. And then you can um, give that information to, for example, humanitarian response teams that will go and uh, deliver the aid quickly. So this is a uh, a tool that is, is increasingly used by, for example, UN agencies, et cetera, to make sure that their humanitarian responses are as fast as possible and as optimal as possible. And there's even um, applications that can be used in, um, in, in our cities. For example, I live in Montreal and um, it's pretty cold as you can imagine, but there's actually quite a lot of sun. Um, and for example, Google did this project where they mapped roofs, uh, once again, based on satellite imagery and actually depending on the size of the roof and also the orientation of the roof. So whether it was oriented to, to ha towards having more sun or less sun, um, they, they can actually map out what the solar potential is of a given city. And you can zoom into your house and you can see if I install solar panels on my house, this is how much uh, energy I can generate. And you can actually compare whether it's enough for your, for your usage. And often it's actually more than you need. And so, uh, as they say, if everyone went solar, hypothetically, in Montreal, we could uh, save as much as 200,000 cars taken off the road, which is massive, right? But it's really important, for example, if I live in a, in a house with a flat roof that's badly uh, oriented by, with regards to the sun, maybe there's no point in me installing a roof. And I'll only know that if someone actually took the care of giving me this information. Um, and so this is a scalable way, a very you know, factual and um, scalable way to deliver this information across the world. So essentially you can enter an address anywhere in the world and get this kind of measurement. So decarbonizing electricity is like the number one challenge um, for tackling climate change. And so if, if we had the power, if we knew what would be the best way to decarbonize, the best way to go renewable, that would give us a lot of, um, a lot of power to make change. And so if you zoom into specific addresses, you can see, for example, the savings you could have, how many, how many square feet available of roof you have, how, much, how many hours of sunlight you have per year, and then like your potential environmental impact, but yours specifically. So that's really powerful to give individuals the tools they need because often um, climate solutions are pretty high, high level, right? Decarbonizing a whole grid or, or, 
or changing the transportation industry, but these are specific changes that we can make as individuals with facts and numbers to guide those changes. So for me, that's really a, a powerful statement. And I think AI is really part uh, of, the, of the solution. So projects that I work on, um, so far these have been projects that other people have worked on, amazing projects that I'm a huge fan of. But um, me personally, I have a few projects going on at Mila Institute. So for example, I have, I'm working on, uh, with a group of people actually, uh, from BCG, from Comet ML, from Haverford College, we were creating um, a CO2 calculator that can um, essentially be deployed when you're running any kind of code, whether AI code or any kind of code, and it will give you an estimate of how much uh, carbon you generated by running this code. Because, you know, if, especially if your code is running for several days on a lot of data, that could be a lot of CO2. And depending on where you are and what kind of electricity you're using, it actually adds up pretty quickly. So I don't know if you saw the headlines about an AI model generates as much uh, CO2 as five cars. So that's kind of the edge case. That's kind of the worst possible scenario, but um, it's really important to get a handle on these numbers. And so anyone, uh, no matter what kind of neural network or whatever they run, has an idea of how much CO2 they generate. And so we created this package. Essentially, um, there, either there's a website where you can enter the numbers, like I ran uh, my model for this much time in this uh, region and um, on this hardware, and it gives you an estimate or you can just run the code in background when you're training your models. And then it's gonna print out a file saying, this is how much CO2 you generated and compare it to like miles driven on a car or hours of TV watched. So this is the first project that really tries to help people get a handle um, on how much CO2 they generate, essentially the environmental footprint of AI. I'm working on another project um, that, that tracks butterfly diversity because um, actually climate change has impacted butterfly populations a lot. And um, the Insectarium of Montreal reached out to us to try to use AI in order to plot um, how um, butterfly regions are changing. So for example, maybe you know the monarch that comes from Canada all the way down to Mexico and back every year, but there's other butterflies that are more regional um, and that actually their populations and the regions are shrinking because of changing climates. And so. Um, the Insectarium gave us some data that was gathered uh, via citizen science, so me meaning people submitted this online saying, oh, I saw a butterfly in my, in my backyard and it was this type of butterfly with a photo. And we uh, do uh, AI in order to recognize the type of butterfly on the photo to, to make sure that, that it's really the right one. And then with all these observations, we can actually plot ranges. We can say, well, these butterflies, you know, um, historically have had this range, but now it's changing. And then, so for example, um, uh, certain uh, butterflies are moving north because the because their uh, the temperatures are rising, right? So you can actually plot all this, and you can say, well, climate change is having an impact, and and this is how much the impact is, and then this is this is the butterflies that are less and less seen, etc. So we're working on this. It's actually pretty complex. We're also trying to make a tool for their website when someone submits a photo of a butterfly that they have some recommendations of the species it is. So we're trying to help citizen science and kind of general biological science at the same time. Um, my ma main project is uh, visualizing the consequences of climate change. Um, and so the idea behind this is that the impacts of climate change are pretty subtle right now. I mean, arguably, there's a lot of extreme weather events, but they're often far away from us. And so we have trouble realizing to what extent it can impact us and our children. And so we created this project um, where we're helping people essentially travel into the future and imagine what would happen if flooding that um, happened in Bangladesh two weeks ago happened in their own city, in their own street. Um, and so the idea is like to, to raise awareness around climate change using AI. And so for example, this is an image of Los Angeles. And what we do essentially is that we flood this image and we say, okay, we're traveling into the future. Uh, this, this is a, a, type of, a type of flood that can happen in Los Angeles um, if it were hit by the same scale of flooding as in this city. Same thing for Jakarta, for example, Jakarta is actually sinking. It's actually, you know, a city that's under the water line. And so uh, every year there's more and more water infiltrating. And so, uh, but people are still living there. People are still building houses there. So it's actually a, a pretty big, a big issue. Um, you don't want to build a house that in 20 years will be flooded. So the idea is like, we're flooding Jakarta and saying, hey, like if you, <laughs> this is the street next to your home, maybe you, you should consider, uh, you know, either improving the infrastructure or, or, or building in places that are less liable to be flooded. And this is Montreal, actually. So there's parts of Montreal that are pretty close to the water. Um, and that can also be impacted by, uh, for example, the, the flooding of the St. Lawrence River, especially when there's water melt. And so, for example, 
uh, flooding Montreal. And so this is kind of the first phenomenon we've been working on flooding, but we're also working on wildfires and smog to, to really help people project themselves and say, this is what climate change can do. This is what it's possible to do. And so it's not too late to make a change and to make an impact. So kind of as a con conclusion, um, I hope that you learn some ways in which uh, AI can be used to tackle climate change. And I hope that it's made you think a bit about the globality of the climate crisis and how we each have a role to play. And no matter what we do or where we work or what our profession is, I truly believe that um, everyone can contribute it to this. And I'm not asking everyone to quit their job, but um, to make connections, to you know, make the make efforts, to to use the skills you have in a way that has a positive impact um, on on the on the planet, on humanity. It's actually a societal crisis. It's not just an environmental crisis, right? And so this is why um, I feel that it's important for society to get involved in general. And AI is obviously one part of the puzzle, but it's not at all the whole puzzle. Um, there are so many connections to be made. There's so many partnerships to be done between policymakers, between scientists, between communicators. So it's really a problem that hopefully humanity will come together on and, and take collective action on um, in, a, in a positive way in the near future. And I really have hope and I hope that you do too. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>